third Sunday of Great Lent. It's hard to believe that three weeks have already passed by. And today we hear one of the most beautiful stories in the entire Bible, I think, in my opinion. A story that summarizes, and I think in a very small way, the most important elements of our faith. We see God's unconditional love for us. We see the consequences of our rejection and our departure from God. We see our need to turn back and to repent whenever we have sinned. And we see this readiness of God's mercy to, to accept us and to, and to enter into a joyous love with, with great humility. And so in the past, we've said that the recurring themes of, of Great Lent are, are fasting and prayer and, and almsgiving and giving. And now we see these other themes starting to emerge. We see forgiveness. We see repentance. And that's going to be the theme for the next couple of weeks. And we see this as a result of our efforts in praying and fasting and giving. That as a, as a consequence of praying and fasting and giving, we start to think about forgiveness and repentance. These are the consequences of these actions. And both of these elements are found in the gospel today. And the story is not unfamiliar to us, hopefully. Uh, this spoiled, undeserving son takes from his father what is rightfully his at the wrong time. And he abuses it. And after ruining his life and his reputation and his future, he decides to do one thing. He decides to return. And he learns a big lesson in all of this, that his life was perfect before. He didn't lack anything before. And it was he who wanted things differently. But those things would not make his life better. They only, in fact, made them worse. And this is like sin for us. We, we think we need something better in our life. But actually, it makes it worse. It, and after it gets the best of us, it ruins us. And we desire to return to our old life, and we settle for less than, than what we had from before. Many times... It's not until we hit rock bottom that we wake up and we try to change our lives similar to what it used to be. And if we don't return to God during Lent, when will we? What better time? What better time if, if I'm not pr praying and, and fasting and, and reading more and forgiving and confessing and, and changing, when will I start if not Lent? So this is a, a great moment of reflection, the halfway point of Great Lent. And so we see this picture of the son who asks for his inheritance from his father, and then he proceeded to squander his inheritance. And, um, and he earned um, these, these hard-earned resources that, that he was given were just used carelessly in a negligent way. And so how do we know the son used them in a, in a careless way, in a negligent way? Because... Everything that he chose to do was for himself. Everything that, was, that he did was for his pleasure. He lived a selfish life, an unbalanced life, um, a way that was, and it wasn't long before that lifestyle caught up, caught up with him. It was unavoidable. He lived for his own desire and his own happiness. And that does exactly opposite of what we might think it does. Instead of helping us, it, and strengthening us, it actually it chops us down. It destroys us. It divides our body and our hearts and our minds. And we live a life of self-indulgence. And we seek after our own desires and we become confused and lost. So we all act similar to this young man. I know I do. We look at our lives and we often think that certain things are owed to us. We act as if everything that we desire is kind of like a birthright. It's owed to us. We feel this, this feeling of entitlement sometimes. I know I'm speaking for myself. And that's not a good thing. In fact, it's a sign of, of rebellion against God. We take what is not rightfully ours and we consider it our own. We take what is not rightfully ours and we forget about the source from which those blessings even came from. This is what the young son has done in the story, and this is what we do, or what I do in my life. And it's only a matter of time before that young man ruined his life. 
He had everything. He could, anything that he wanted or desired. But all of this stuff was just for temporary gain. We lose sight of that. When we, he would lose it all in a blink of an eye and go back to square one as a young, immature boy with nothing to his name. We do the same thing as this young man. When we take what is rightfully ours, what rightfully uh, belongs to the Lord, and we use it in whatever way we see fit. We do this, even in ways that are against God. We do the same in our, in our everyday lives. We use our bodies, we use our minds, our lips, our energy, our, our gifts that are given from God and in ways that are not always pleasing to God. I'll say it like that. And so we have to reflect on some important questions today as we reflect on the prodigal son. Why do we exist? Do we exist to serve ourselves? Do we exist to pass our time to grow old and then die? No. We exist because God has breathed life into each one of us. We are his sons and daughters. He has given us purpose in life. Each one of us is important. Each one of us is a son and daughter of God. Each one of us is a son and daughter like this young man. And each one of us can be lost when we think that we can live our own independent life away from the Father. We got this. I know what I'm doing. I have a plan. The young man thought the same thing as soon as he found himself without friends and away from the parties, without a penny left to his name. And as he went to work for one of the people in the fields feeding the swine, his heart began to turn back to his father and back to his home. And that, what was that, what was that process of, of turning his heart? It was his hunger. It was his hunger. Why do we fast to prepare for the great and holy resurrection? Why do we fast? Because it's the hunger that brings us to our right minds and it turns us back to God and back to our Father, and back to his house, which is the church. The young man, he fasted unwillingly due to his foolishness. But we as Christians, we fast willingly due to the wisdom of the church. We want to hunger and thirst and desire after God. And so it's important to grow hungry. It's important not to take shortcuts during the fast not always looking for the luxurious substitutes for things to make it feel comparable to what we were eating before the fast. It's okay to be hungry. It's okay to have simpler foods and simpler meals. Our bodies are closely tied to salvation and as well as our condemnation. So we prepare. We take this time of Lent to be like the young man who, after feeling true hunger, He came to himself. He came back to his right mind. And he turned his focus back to the Father. And he repented. But it's important that we see in the prodigal son story, there's there's always a chance to turn back, no matter how far we feel like we've strayed away. No matter our situation, no matter how far we've fallen, no matter how far we've squandered our gifts, or wasted our inheritance, or these talents that God has given us, God stands ready not only to forgive us, but to run to us, to welcome us back to his home, the church. And he runs and to welcome us back to share in his banquet on the altar. And this brings me to this point that I, I like to reflect on the father of the story because the scholars have said that This parable should not be, you know, titled as the prodigal son. It should be the parable of the loving father. That's more important to the story. The parable of the forgiving father, as some has commented. And we understand this by, uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper here. The younger son is returning to confess to the father. And it says in scripture, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And then it goes on to say, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put on a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. A big feast. He received him. He embraced him. He loved him. Some say that the son repented and he returned because he knew of the great love of his father. And I want to take a, a little closer look at the, at the father as a main character of the story today. After all, our Lord begins this parable in verse 11 by saying, a certain man had two sons. The focus is the man with his two sons. Again, that's why the commentators say it's the loving father, the forgiving father. Let's see why. First, after the younger brother asks for his share of his father's estate, the father immediately and simply gives him the inheritance. In verse 12, this is very clear. The father doesn't lecture his son. He doesn't have any strings attached to, to his giving. He doesn't rebuke his son. He... He doesn't condemn him for his greediness and his impatience or anything like that. As we know, the younger son, he squanders his share. He lives with prodigal or loose living in verse 13. And he ends up in total poverty or isolation. And once he hits rock bottom, like we were saying, the younger son comes to himself. And he realizes how far he is from his, his own father, and his father's values, and his lifestyle, and things like that. And so he decides to return with total humility and repentance in verses 17 to 20. Secondly, the prodigal son is returning to his homeland. It says in verse 20, when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Obviously, all the time that the son was away, the father had been looking intently for him. He was waiting for him to return. The father did not forget about his son. He did not um, escape to occupy himself with other things, to keep himself busy while his, he's upset with his son that, that went away. No, he was, he was looking for his son every single day to come back. And his, and his father did not wait for his son to arrive at the front door to teach him a lesson. You come to me. No, he saw his son coming and he ran to greet him while he was still a far way off, maybe even at the outskirts of town. And his father didn't interrogate him. Where's all your money? What did he do? He didn't lecture him. I told you so. You're too young to handle this stuff. You're too immature. No, he had compassion. He had compassion on him. Knowing the pain and losing everything and the loneliness and humiliation. Knowing all this, he showed his son true human love, compassion, and affection, embracing him, not even with words. He didn't even let his son finish his rehearsed confession. He stopped all that. He just hugged him and kissed him, embraced him. And even though the son came back and he begged to be a slave in his father's house, his father gives him gifts that are unbelievable. Even his older son was upset about this. A robe, a ring, sandals, and a great banquet. Again, his father could have forgotten all these things. He could have made the younger son a slave in order to teach him a lesson. But the robe signifies baptism and a new life. The ring is a promise of, faith, of faithfulness. The sandals are signify the ability to walk a new path. The banquet is communion with his father and the family and the church. In other words, the father's love expressed through forgiveness and led to a complete full restoration of body and soul to the prodigal son. And then, and then when the older son gets jealous and angry about how the younger is being treated despite the squandering of his inheritance and the loose living the father affirms the righteous path of the older son with gentleness. This unbroken communion that has been happening with the older son and the father, he reaffirms this. He says, and the father said to the son, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. 
And the father was gently encourages his older son to make him merry and glad. He says, it is right that we should make merry and be married and glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost in his family. In other words, the father tells him not to focus on the sins of his brother. Don't focus on the past, but be joyful that he has gone from death to life to repentance. The father, he doesn't lecture or scold the older son for his judgmental attitude or his heart, uh, his heart, heart or anything like that. And so we have to remember that the loving father, the loving, forgiving father in today's gospel is our God, our father in heaven. He has already bestowed on us the inheritance of eternal life through baptism and chrismation. And the thing is, it's it's ours to lose, not ours to earn. When we lose this heavenly existence through our self-centered, our pleasure-seeking ways and our actions, our Father sees us suffering. And he's waiting for us to realize what we've lost. Not with an I told you so, but with compassion and mercy. And then we take our first step and we turn towards back to him. And God comes rushing towards us. And he showers us with love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Infusing us with a new life in the Holy Spirit. So, great and holy Lent is our time to repent. It happens throughout the whole year, but this is a heightened time in, in the church calendar. And we, we're asking to, to turn our hearts away from our self-seeking attitudes and to turn back to the Father. To understand that all of our desires are not filled by various things. Not even with food. Not even with food. Our deepest desires are met with, with, by God, the Father, who loves us. And he freely gives to us all the things that belong to him. The father celebrated with his sons. The return as if he had come back from the dead. So let us also come back from the dead by the grace of God. Let us turn from death, from our sins and our earthly desires to the resurrection and life and communion with him. It is truly our God's good pleasure to give you everything that he has and that he is proven to us by giving his his only begotten son. We, we will be surprised to see him waiting for us, ready to embrace us, to love us, and to bring us back to his own house to enjoy the great feast together with him. And glory be to God forever. Amen.